So, as I was saying, uh, the title of the presentation, uh, it was something that I, I worked on as of 2016, and I titled it uh, New Fascism and the Mimetic Unconscious. And here you have a, a passage or a, or a, a section of uh, the Italian translation of the book, which came out last year. The uh, English version came out in 2019. And when I started working on, on the subject of uh, fascism, or as I call it, uh, new fascism, uh, well, it, it was uh, still a controversial term to use such a strong term that comes out of the 20th century uh, and to talk about contemporary politic, I, I, politics, it, it was still very much controversial. And, um, and that's why there are brackets around the new that I will explain in a moment. But I should say that as uh, Simon pointed out, if not fascism itself, at least the shadow of fascism or the phantom of fascism uh, has uh, clearly reappeared on uh, the political scene, both in, in, in Europe, the US, Brazil, and other parts of, of the world. And just to keep up with the literature on fascism, which I haven't, uh, I stopped reading on the subject in 2019, um, uh, is, is an immense task. These are just books that have appeared after I published uh, my book, uh, Spectres of Fascism, New Fascism, Neo Fascism. These are terms that are indeed used today to talk about what it used to be, uh, used to be described as uh, uh, right-wing populism. Uh, and uh, I belong among, I think, uh, uh, a growing number of scholars that call attention to certain continuities uh, with historical fashion, fascism without necessarily conflating uh, the, two, the two phenomena. And that will be uh, indeed the, the challenge. Uh, with respect to, to this problematic. Um, so when the book came out, uh, New Fascism, Contagion Community Myth, uh, I was still based in the US. And I, and I say this also because this kind of uh, philosophical thinking about the present uh, is somehow always historically situated. So I, I find it important to locate myself uh, um, in, a, in a specific period and space when I started worrying about uh, new fascism. I was in the US still at Johns Hopkins University and, uh, and, and Donald Trump was still basically known as a celebrity figure from uh, a TV show titled uh, the, the Apprentice. And, and few people in uh, political science or uh, political philosophy were, were taking him seriously at the time. Uh, before before the primaries, uh, he was not considered a, a serious candidate. Um, and uh, uh, there were some exceptions. And uh, being at Johns Hopkins, I had the chance to collaborate with uh, William Connolly, who uh, came to uh, KU Leuven. I invited him uh, a few uh, years ago, I think last year, uh, to, to give a talk in relationship to fashion. So there were exceptions, but that those were a minority. And so if you just look at uh, the news, uh, you know, after what happened on January 6, uh, it became uncontroversial to use the term fascist pro propaganda or fascism to talk about uh, the strategies that uh, were implemented during the insurrection. But these strategies were well at play throughout the four years of uh, the campaign. I mean, the presidency and uh, uh, during the campaign as well. Um, and so um, the topic is now, I think, uh, center stage in, uh, in Europe as well, as Simon reminded us in the Netherlands, but also Germany and uh, many different countries uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, the task of, well, philosophy, one of the tasks of philosophy is to try to um, maybe uh, be ahead of the curve with respect to such topics before they hit the front pages. Uh, and, uh, and for that, um, um, I'm, I'm not kind of starting from zero. Uh, 
I'm relying on a genealogy of thinkers who uh, attuned me to, to the danger of uh, uh, new fascist insurrections. And, uh, and some of them are actually far removed uh, from contemporary, uh, contemporary politics. They've often been uh, linked to the right. Uh, and one of them is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, an important figure uh, for the Homo Hermeticus project and for the, for the book, uh, New Fascism in particular, is, is Nietzsche. Uh, whose antisemitism, of course, was, uh, was uh, injected by the sister uh, and has long been disreputed in philosophy, but still is a figure that in popular culture can be linked to uh, neo-fascist uh, readings of the Übermensch, which is not at all what Nietzsche is writing about. His position on, uh, and against German nationalism and antisemitism is very, very clear in his writings. And what I found in Nietzsche are certain diagnostic arrows that seem to point to what is happening today. And one of them, I mention it because I use it uh, as an epigraph at the beginning of the book. Uh, it's from Gay Science, where Nietzsche says that it is thus that the maddest and most interesting ages of history always emerge when the actors, Schauspieler, all kinds of actors become the real masters. So uh, I find this, uh, this passage or this moment interesting. The context is Nietzsche's critique of Wagner and uh, it's in gay, gay Science Book Five, which is very much linked to, to the Nietzsche contra Wagner book and the case of Wagner uh, books. And so what Nietzsche is objecting to in Wagner is not so much his music as an aesthetic phenomenon, but he's uh, uh, critiquing his theatrical strategies. Um, which uh, Nietzsche argues have the power to cast a magnetic spell on the crowd, uh, on what he calls masse. Mm. And uh, uh, so that uh, specific connection between a figure who is a, a public personality, which enacts theatrical strategies in order to magnetize the crowd is something that is central to my diagnostic. And I'll come back to that in, in more detail. Uh, in a moment. But what I find also interesting in, in uh, uh, Nietzsche's uh, recuperation of the actor, uh, or to use a more ancient term, uh, the mimos, uh, the mime, for political purposes, is the fact that Nietzsche himself is sitting in a much more ancient uh, tradition. Um, as a classical philologist, he was steeped in Greek thought. And that leads me basically to the foundations of the Homo Mimeticus project. And I'll say a few things about it without entering into any details. And usually what I mention about uh, this project is that Plato and Aristotle disagreed on the value of mimesis understood as representation, as a copy uh, or reproduction of the world. Um, but they fundamentally agreed that humans are mimetic animals and that it is through imitation that humans assume uh, certain identities, behaviors, and thoughts, be they rational, as for Aristotle, and irrational uh, for Plato. So there is that fundamental agreement that we are mimetic uh, creatures in that behavioral, call it psychological, anthropological uh, sense, uh, and uh, that uh, specific realization is at the center of the project. So the project sits on those broad shoulders. It has um, an aesthetic part. As Simon mentioned, I, I work also in uh, the Faculty of Arts in English, where uh, a figure like Oscar Wilde uh, occupies an interesting role. Uh, Wilde was also trained in philology like, like Nietzsche. He considered a, a career in classics at, at uh, Oxford. Mm. And this, there is this famous epigraph uh, by Oscar Wilde that says that life imitates art more than art imitates life. Um, and uh, often even by Wilde scholar, it is taken as one of those ironic witty uh, epigrams um, that should make us laugh, but not think. But, uh, but uh, Wilde manages to do both to make us think and laugh. And his argument is basically that we are shaped by aesthetic models that uh, theatrical models in particular, he was a dramatist, have a power to shape audience emotions and attitudes. Um, 
So that's uh, one part of the uh, project and uh, uh, it's a collective project. So there are different parts of it. I have uh, a team that works uh, on uh, the musical side of my thesis. Daniel developed that part. Um, posthumanism via science fiction. So I cannot give an account of the entire uh, project, but I just simply indicate those elements that resonate with uh, the discussion today. The other is uh, Nietzsche. As I mentioned already, Nietzsche developed genealogies and uh, the way he understood genealogy as uh, an activity that is gray and goes beyond good and evil. Um, is by uh, paying attention not only to, to what I would call antiquarian history, history for the sake of history uh, and understanding the past, but an hist history that is attentive to the present. And uh, genealogy as, as Nietzsche practices, it is interdisciplinary. So as he makes clear in the genealogy of morals, he relies on uh, philology, of course, that's his training, uh, but also psychology. Uh, that's, uh, he often defines himself as a psychologist, anthropology and uh, other disciplines in uh, what we now call the, the human sciences. So that's also part of the uh, project and of the book on fascism in particular, in particular the idea to, to have a look at the history of the present. So it's not something that I had planned uh, to work on um, when I drafted the ERC uh, project. I, I always mention it as an anecdote, but I think it's uh, it's important. But during the interview, the URC interview, I was asked why I consider this concept, this ancient and kind of you know often repeated concept of mimesis important. And it was in June of 2016, so way before uh, you know indications that Trump would would be uh, the winner uh, actually appeared. And uh, my answer was took some risk. I said it a little bit ironically, but I said I come from the US and uh, uh, there are some apprentice actors that know very well uh, how to operate uh, on a mimetic registers. And so as scholars, we have to catch up with that reality. And uh, some laughed and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, that might have worked in my favor. It could have backfired, of course, because it could have been wrong. Uh, uh, so uh, ERC grants are often risk, high risk, high gain kind of um, stakes uh, projects. And so uh, I went for that risk. So that's the general shape of the project. If you haven't seen it yet, I know many of you have. We have a, a website, uh, omomimeticos.eu. And one thing that is directly linked to the book is that uh, figures like Jean-Luc Nancy who have written influentially uh, about community, also in relationship to, to fascism and fascist communities, came to Leuven a couple of years ago and we did a, a video interview. So if you missed the event, you can see the uh, video. And there are others like with other interdisciplinary figures um, like Edgar Morin, who is a sociologist, but also philosopher, anthropologist, Diffic difficult to classify. Um, but uh, um, that's basically the, general uh, scope of the project. Now, uh, to focus a little bit more on, on this term new fascism, I put brackets around the new uh, precisely to question or to bracket uh, the uh, simple association uh, between what is happening now in different manifestations, different ways in different countries and the historical fascism that is uh, uh, linked to Hitler and and Mussolini uh, in Italy. There are a number of books on historical fascism already. Uh, and uh, I'm not in any way arguing that new fascism can be easily assimilated with historical fascism in the sense that these governments rely on a, a, a unique party that in which the leader has total control and uh, totally excludes um, democratic participation. Even in the case of uh, the US, we've seen that that was not the case. So it's, not also, it's also not an account of fascism in terms of its ideology. Um, there are a number of good studies on that. And al although there are a number of continuities, I would say, between the contemporary manifestations of racism and xenophobia, uh, sexism, hypernationalism, uh, exclusion of uh, minorities and so forth that we see today, um, I'm not arguing for a straightforward assimilation with historical fascism, hence the brackets. Uh, the term fascism is there in order to call attention uh, 
to the fact that it might be risky to group uh, leaders that are on the far right or extreme right under the rubric of populism, simply because populism seems to me to blur uh, the, right, the, the line between left and right in a way that can be uh, beneficial to leaders on the far right. Uh, if you take a leader like Donald Trump as a populist, uh, uh, then indeed that is part of his rhetoric that he speaks for the people. Uh, and uh, that is something that I wanted to, to avoid, to use that term without necessarily setting up uh, uh, big or major conflicts with figures who use that term and are, and are critical of the far right. I'm thinking of Chantal Mou, for instance, who came uh, to Leuven as well um, to give a talk on, on the subject. Um, so uh, my focus is primarily on Donald Trump because I started, as I mentioned, writing about uh, fascism in the US and simply because after he, he, uh, he gained the election, uh, he provided me with a case study to analyze something specific within the rhetoric of new fascism to which I, I will uh, return in a moment. So that's my main case study. Do I think that the, the book uh, is relevant as well for other manifestations of uh, new fascism in, in Europe um, that very often copied uh, Trump's behavior. The use of social media, for instance, wasn't as disseminated before Trump became president on the far right, even though it was uh, used um, before. And so there are a number of books that came out recently. Um, these are books that actually came out when I was still writing that I could mention. Uh, in my uh, work, but in passing because it was quite late. Madeleine Albright, Fascism, A Warning, Jason Stanley, uh, a philosopher at, at Yale, How Fascism Works, and Bill Connolly, uh, Aspirational Fascism that I, I have already mentioned. And uh, I felt that even with, uh, uh, if these books called attention to the continuities and discontinuities between historical fascism and new fascism, there was still space for a, a specific diagnostic that paid attention to what I group under this ancient notion of mimesis, um, contemporary manifestations of uh, imitative behavior that seemed to me to play an important role in historical fascism, but also and especially in new fascism. So my book is not a book of history, uh, even though it deals with history, obviously. It's not a book that focuses primarily on fascism as an ideology. There are plenty of excellent studies. Uh, I mentioned Robert Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism. I think it's one of the most informed books, but also Georges Moss, The Fascist Revolution. There are a number of very good books on that aspect. Um, but I was specifically attentive to um, the sphere of mimetic affects or emotions. And a starting point for that, and that's uh, the uh, uh, epigraph I use for the book, um, is uh, Umberto Eco, who had written in the 1990s already an article for the New Yorker titled uh, Ur Fascism or Eternal Fascism. And uh, that's uh, taken uh, from the epigraph of my book, just that sentence uh, where Eco says, Ur Fascism can come back under the most innocence of disguises. Our duty is to uncover it and to point our finger at any of its new instances every day in every part of the world. And I thought that was an invitation uh, to pick up that challenge and uh, point uh, the finger towards manifestations of what he calls for fascism that seem very innocent or even comic, but that we should uh, be taking seriously. Now, Umberto Eco in his article gives a number of characteristics that he considers constitutive of ur fascism. And uh, they have less to do with an ideology um, than with uh, the, the sphere of emotion. Um, and uh, you can read them, you know, the cult of tradition, for instance, or action for action's sake, uh, the intolerance for disagreement. If there is disagreement, you have treason in me immediately, fear of difference. Uh, an appeal to the frustrated middle class or working class, an, an obsession with a plot that always puts uh, uh, the old fascist in the position of the victim. Um, 
um, the idea that life is a permanent struggle, uh, a certain contempt for weakness and celebration of macho personalities, uh, machismo, yes, uh, and uh, a populism that is highly selective because uh, it pretends to speak for the people while making the interest of the uh, super rich. Um, and uh, uh, Umberto Eco also indicates the use of a certain new speak, uh, takes from George Orwell, 1984, um, that uh, impoverishes language, a certain inability to, to speak, which Anna Arendt considered one of the characteristics of the banality of evil, understood as then an inability to think once language is simplified. Uh, so Arendt is also part of uh, this diagnostic, though I won't be able to talk about her uh, today. Um, so these are some of the characteristics that Umberto Eco mentions and that are uh, emphasized by other studies on fascism. I mentioned uh, Robert Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism, where he speaks of the emotional lava that sets the foundations uh, of uh, uh, fascism. Um, so these uh, uh, questions of emotions that are really constitutive of uh, the uh, ideology uh, and the way the ideology is put into practice, more importantly. And also this notion of the leader's superior instincts. Um, the identification with a strong leader that serves as the head of the body politic understood as an organism uh, in which the leader is the head and manages to effectively uh, cast a spell on, uh, on the body politic. This is something that uh, a book that came out early uh, by Timothy Snyder titled On Tyranny also mentions um, and uh, it came out in 2017. And Snyder speaks of uh, the effort to define the shape and significance of events requires words and concepts that elude us when we are entranced by visual stimuli is uh, responding to the fact uh, of uh, uh, the fact that new leaders like new fascist leaders like Trump use television uh, and Twitter. Uh, and he argues for the necessity of concepts and words to fight this entranced uh, effect generated by visual uh, stimuli that generate what he calls a collective trance, uh, rendering it normal. We take this collective trance to be normal. Now, this notion of trance uh, or of emotional lava, uh, of a certain ability of the leader to operate on the emotional register is central to the conception of mimesis that uh, I propose to uh, revisit in the Homo Mimeticus project, but also in the book, uh, New Fascism. This is the Italian uh, translation, which opted for the term neo-fascism, always uh, in brackets. And uh, the contemporary concepts that uh, seem to group uh, uh, this affective dimension of my mimesis, uh, were, those that I chose were with three concepts, the one of contagion, of community, and myth. And uh, uh, so I'm looking at fascism with a specific attention to emotions and specifically to emotions that are contagious, that generate organic communities, and uh, uh, are in very much in line with, with myth. And so if you have a look at uh, the structure of uh, the book, it's divided in three chapters with um, uh, a coda where I have a discussion with uh, William Connolly. Um, one is devoted to crowd psychology, uh, which is a discipline that is specifically, specifically attentive to emotional contagion. Um, and uh, uh, I established a connection between crowd psychology, and I'll tell you more about that, which is a discipline that emerged in the late 19th century. And uh, René Girard, who is uh, a thinker of mimesis who writes in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they're often linked to, to mimetic theory. Uh, strangely enough, Girard doesn't speak about crowd psychology as a discipline. And it seemed to me that if you're interested in establishing genealogies, it's interesting to establish a connection. So the chapter uh, establish a link between uh, Girard's mimetic theory, which focuses on desire and scapegoating mechanisms and crowd psychology. 
The second chapter is more devoted to community. And I mentioned in the introduction that Jean-Luc Nancy is among uh, the influential philosophers who recuperated a notion of community that was uh, historically linked to fascism and communism uh, in, in the 20s and 30s. And uh, uh, it has been little emphasized that Nancy bases his diagnostic of what he calls inoperative community as, an, as a, a reaction against uh, fascist organic communities. Uh, he recuperates that concept from Georges Bataille, who was a philosopher, anthropologist, sociologist, writing in the 30s. And Bataille offered one of actually the first study of fascism in France in a book titled The Psychological Structure of Fascism. That is not very well known, but is central to Nancy's account of community. And so that chapter establishes a continuity between the Luc Nancy notion of community and Bataille notion of uh, um, or account of the psychological structure of fascism. Maybe I, you know, I'm giving you the structure. I won't have time to enter in, in all the details of the book, but so you have a sense of the movement. Uh, but I was interested in uh, object subject matters. If you're familiar with the work of Kristeva, for instance, she takes the notion of the object from Bataille. And Bataille pointed out that uh, object subject matters that are linked to eroticism uh, and are taboo um, can generate movements of attraction and repulsion uh, when they are embodied by a charismatic leader. And these examples were Hitler and Mussolini. But we have seen that erotic matters were central to the Trump presidency, constantly on the news, uh, affairs with pornographic stars and so forth, that can be easily dismissed as marginal to fascism. And yet uh, there is a, a, a tradition and Bataille is part of it that calls attention to the fact that eroticism can be put uh, to fascist use. Uh, it generates movements of attraction and repulsion. Uh, the third chapter is on myth, um, uh, and there the starting point is uh, Philippe Lacoulabart and Jean-Luc Nancy, they co-authored an article titled The Nazi Myth, which came out in Critical Inquiry in the 80s in translation, and they defined myth uh, as an instrument of identification. So less as a lie, even though uh, that tradition is certainly present in, the, uh, in their conceptualization of myth as well, but an effective in instrument of identification, a mimetic instrument in, in that sense. So these are the three chapters uh, that, that structure the book. And I thought, you know, I don't have time to enter in all the details that I would take the remaining time to tell you maybe a little bit more about the first chapter by paying attention to a figure that I, I mentioned in the book, but I don't discuss in much detail because I've done it elsewhere, but actually informs my account of what I call the mimetic unconscious. And since uh, that's part of the title, the, the mimetic unconscious, I thought that a confrontation with the tradition of the unconscious uh, with respect to emotional contagion, in particular and crowd behavior, could uh, be useful uh, to account for new fascist movements in a period like this one, in which we're very susceptible to uh, collective emotions. And we are seeing it uh, in a number of ways. And that, that figure is, of course, Sigmund Freud. Um, when it comes to the unconscious, uh, it's uh, difficult to elude uh, Freud. So I'll, I'll tell you more about, about Freud. And it's part of the discussion of the first chapter. Mm. But before I, I, I go to Freud, uh, I should say that my starting point remains Nietzsche uh, when it comes uh, to uh, issues of psychology and specifically the unconscious. I, I mentioned gay science already and there is another quote that I wanna give to you uh, from the gay science. Oh, this I made a mistake, it's not from the gay science, from Daybreak, um, uh, where uh, Nietzsche says, and I quote it, I just need to move the zoom bar that prevents me from seeing it. Whatever they may think and say about their egoism, the great majority nonetheless do nothing for their ego their whole life long. What they do is done for the phantom of their ego, in phantom von ego, which has formed itself in the heads of those around them and has been communicated, mitigated to them. As a consequence, they all of them dwell in a fog of impersonal, semi-personal opinions and arbitrary, as it were, 
poetical evaluations, the one forever in the head of someone else and the head of this someone else again in the head of others, a strange world of fantasies. So this is a, a, a quote that is uh, central to another book that I titled using the Nietzsche phrase, The Phantom of the Ego, which actually provides the foundation for the new fascism book. And so a lot of what is in the new fascism, I don't, it's presupposed, comes from the Phantom of the Ego, where I try to give an account of this process of contamination or communication, which Nietzsche calls mitteilung, that leads the self to become a copy, a shadow, or a phantom of another self, specifically as it's part of a crowd or a herd. That's uh, the, the context of uh, Nietzsche's critique, herd behavior. And I mentioned this to say that this process for Nietzsche is unconscious and it's uh, often linked uh, to, to the crowd, which he considers as a manifestation of the unconscious. And, and that for genealogical reasons, I consider it important because when we say the unconscious, we often think automatically that Freud discovered it. Whereas of course, there is a strong, uh, there's, there's a strong genealogy of precursors um, of uh, this discovery of which Nietzsche, but also Schopenhauer, Pierre Janet, many, many others uh, are part. Um, and so I'm interested in understanding how this communication works. How can a self be entranced, to use uh, Timothy Snyder's term, to that point that is his or her ego becomes a shadow or a copy of another ego? Now, a text that came out a little bit later, like 10 years later, uh, after Nietzsche wrote uh, uh, Daybreak, um, is a book by Gustave Le Bon, titled Psychologie de Foule, uh, 1895. Uh, the crowd, I think, is uh, the translation. And um, this is a problematic book in, in many ways. I don't have to, uh, I mean, I don't have time to enter into the details, but the Le Bon was a, a conservative whose fear was not the fear of fascism, of course, we are in the 19th century, but uh, of uh, socialism. Um, and the racist and sexist uh, uh, um, assumption with respect to crowd behavior. The crowd is often feminine and primitive uh, for Le Bon. Why do I mention it nonetheless? Uh, because I think that despite this ideological bias, there is something interesting in Le Bon when it comes to understanding this dynamic of unconscious communication uh, within the crowd. Um, here is just a, a quote where it says, the solution of conscious personality dominance of the unconscious personality, personality inconscient, orientation by way of suggestion and contagion of feelings and ideas towards the same direction, tendency to transform suggested ideas immediately into actions. These are the principal characteristics of the individual who is part of a crowd. He's no longer himself, an automaton whose will no longer has the power to lead. So this is a, a diagnostic of the crowd that will be very important for Freud. As we'll see in a moment, uh, Freud quotes it, actually, this passage, you'll find it in, in a book by Freud titled uh, Group Psychology and Analysis of the Ego, uh, to which I will return in a moment. And Freud quotes it because he fundamentally agrees with Le Bon uh, on uh, a number of issues. Uh, first of all, that the crowd, uh, uh, offers uh, a manifestation of, of the unconscious, of the unconscious personality. So implicitly acknowledging that there are theories of the unconscious before he discovered it. Um, that affective contagion, uh, which is the term that uh, Le Bon uses. And Le Bon, and this is interesting today, was taking the notion of contagion from Pasteur, from uh, contamination by microbes that was recent still at the time. Uh, and uh, he was using this notion of a, of a biological contagion in order to account for a, this strange contagion that seemed to overtake people who are part of a crowd and feel and catch like a virus, the emotion uh, from others. Mm. So the notion of contagion stems uh, from Pasteur, uh, if you look at Le Bon's uh, uh, source. Mm. 
Gabriel Tard, another uh, thinker of uh, the crowd, is currently coming back uh, after a century of neglect because Deleuze, Bruno Latour, and figures linked to them uh, call attention to, uh, uh, to Tard's theory of imitation, called this effective contagion limitation. Um, so there is a link between contagion and imitation within crowd psychology. And this is something that figures like uh, uh, René Girard don't uh, uh, emphasize. And for Le Bon, uh, the presence of a leader, what he calls meneur, is decisive in order to generate uh, those emotions of contagion in the crowd. A leader uh, endowed with prestige. Um, there is no crowd without a leader or no permanent crowd without a leader. And it's a, without a strong leader. Uh, and that's something that Freud will also agree with uh, in the text that we will see in a moment. But the analogy that I, I want to stress for the moment is the fact that uh, for Le Bon, uh, the uh, leader or meneur um, as an hypnotic or suggestive, the term that he uses is suggestion, power over the crowd. Uh, just like a doctor can hypnotize a patient, so the meneur can hypnotize the crowd. There is this connection between uh, individual psychology and collective psychology. Um, and uh, if uh, hypnosis comes out of mental pathology, uh, the phenomenon is, uh, is nonetheless uh, uh, non-pathological in the sense it's common. Uh, it's uh, part of social behavior for, for Le Bon. And uh, uh, when it comes to the specific techniques that a leader or meneur can rely on in order to induce this contagion in the crowd, uh, uh, Le Bon is quite specific. So he says, well, you should, the leader, the meneur should repeat, uh, not explain, but just repeat uh, very often a simple message. You should affirm it. Uh, despite the fact that the message might be uh, uh, based on a lie, the repetition and affirmation is crucial to the success uh, of the leader. The use of images, not thoughts or concepts, but images uh, uh, operate more directly on the crowd. Exaggerations, uh, so everything should be hyperbolic. Um, uh, affirmation, we have it already and lies, but also violent emotions that very often can be turned against outsiders. You can generate a feeling of community if you direct violent emotions outside towards what Girard will later call scapegoats. So he's saying this in 1895. Uh, and the reason I, I think that despite the fact that Le Bon's text is problematic for a number of ideological reasons, when it comes to the rhetoric of fascism, I think that we have seen this rhetoric work uh, repeatedly uh, in the case of the US, but, but not only. Um, and, uh, and the tendency might be to dismiss it because it's sim it appears simple, you know, just repeat uh, or an image, build a wall, uh, lock her up, just affirmations that seem to make no sense and yet have that visceral power on the unconscious. And the unconscious for Le Bon is the crowd. Uh, the crowd, he says, is suggestible, ignores contradictions. So logical inconsistencies uh, are not necessarily a problem from the point of view of the crowd. It's prone to violence and uh, wants or needs a leader. So requests that kind of uh, um, figure that embodies uh, the body politic. Now, in order to explain the contagion, uh, Le Bon speaks of an unconscious imitation. That's also a phrase that appears in, in Tard. Um, and that is defined as a, and this is actually Freud, um, defines it as an irreducible primitive phenomenon, a fundamental fact in the mental life of man. So for the tradition of crowd psychology that precedes Freud, uh, this imitation or suggestion is the term that is actually used, a suggestion, is, is a primitive phenomenon in the sense that it's, it's there from the beginning and it's a fundamental fact that uh, causes this openness to emotional contagion. Um, that at least is the position of the crowd psychologists uh, before Freud, of Le Bon, but also of 
Gabriel Tard, uh, William McDougall, Wilfred Trotter, a number of other crowd psychologists. And uh, that's where uh, Freud comes in. As I said, he agrees with basically everything uh, in Le Bon's diagnostic. Uh, and uh, he starts by pointing out uh, that the contrast between individual psychology uh, or social uh, and gr or group psychology, which at first glance may seem to be full of significance, loses a great deal of its sharpness when it is examined more closely. This is very much in line with Le Bon, with the idea of uh, hypnosis. Mm. Just like a doctor hypnotizes the patient, so the leader hypnotizes the crowd. And the gesture in Freud, that's the first sentence of the book of group psychology and the analysis of the ego, whose uh, actually German title is Massenpsychologie und die Analyse. So uh, the notion of Massen is closer to crowd than to group. Uh, it has that direct connection to Le Bon's diagnostic. But for Freud, uh, he starts by deconstructing this distinction between individual psychology and group psychology. And that already tells us that the strategy behind the book is to basically rely on psychoanalysis, which comes out of individual psychology, in order to account for emotions that are at play in the body politic. Uh, there is this kind of extensive move and this, 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 this book belongs to the cultural uh, books of the late Freud, like Totem and Taboo and Civilization Its Discontents, where he broadened psychoanalysis to account for cultural phenomena. Um, so there is that drive. And uh, uh, the risk of that the tendency, though, uh, in Freud might be that the, uh, that the crowd uh, or the dynamic of group psychology, mass psychology, is reduced to individual psychology. And it's a danger that it's there in both Le Bon and, and Freud. So there are possibilities and, and limitation in this move that might be a drive to uh, edipalize the crowd. So we we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but uh, the main point I wanna make is that uh, Freud agrees fundamentally with Le Bon. Uh, he starts, as you see here, the table of contents with a, a long description on uh, Le Bon's account of the crowd or the group mind. It's a very short book, by the way, this group psychology and analysis of the ego, it's 70, 80 pages. And the, you see the chapter two on Le Bon is, uh, uh, is pretty long compared to the others. It, it agrees with all characteristic I have mentioned, except with one, which is fundamental to the previous crowd psychology and has to do with this notion of suggestion or hypnosis. Uh, Freud wants to break with that aspect uh, of the crowd theories that precedes him. He is uh, not happy with the notion of suggestion. Uh, the riddle of suggestion, uh, he calls it a, a, a riddle, ein Rätselwort, oder ein Zauberwort, a magic word that explains everything the magic word Zauberwort, suggestion, which explained everything in Le Bon and Tart and others, was itself to be exempt from explanation. So he objects to the fact uh, that uh, uh, suggestion is offered as the key to the crowd without being explicable itself. I mentioned in passing that Freud was of course a solver of riddles and uh, it takes that from uh, a famous precedent that's Oedipus who solves the riddle of the Sphinx. And so there might be a connection with the Freudian solution and Oedipus solution to the riddle of suggestion and by extension of crowd behavior. Um, uh, for the moment, I just point out that he rejects the notion of suggestion, which was uh, advocated by uh, a psychologist uh, called uh, uh, Hippolyte Bernheim, who had written a book de la suggestion, which Freud had translated into German and that he knew very well. Uh, so Freud knew Bernheim's theory of suggestion very well. This is the concept we have seen Le Bon use, the, the leader has the power to cast suggestion uh, or a hypnotic spell on the crowd. Um, and Bernheim defined suggestion as the peculiar predisposition of transforming an idea received into an action. Um, for Bernheim, and I cannot enter into the detail here, uh, 
um, suggestion or hypnosis is not a pathological phenomenon. That was uh, Charcot's position. Uh, and Freud was a student of Charcot uh, as well. Um, he went to Paris to follow his lectures. Here you see famous representation of Charcot's demonstration of la grande hystérie. Uh, and um, for Charcot, hypnosis was pathological, was linked to hysteria. Whereas for Bernheim, all subjects, uh, including normal, he says even intelligent people can be uh, prone to suggestion. The idea of transforming an idea, especially uh, if it comes from a figure of authority into an action. Um, now we were saying this after January 6th. So we've seen one, for, for Bernheim, one doesn't need to be asleep. Hypnosis means from hypnosis, sleep, in order to be vulnerable to suggestion. Yeah. In certain situations, we might be prone to turning certain ideas into actions while being consciously aware um, of doing that. Uh, but nonetheless triggered by something external. Snyder called, called it trance, uh, he called, Bernheim calls it suggestion. So in any case, Freud disagrees with this uh, uh, solution, with the fact that uh, Burnham says there is in the brain uh, a tendency to imitate others um, and suggestion is a form of imitation. Um, he breaks with that tradition. What is the Freudian solution to the riddle. Uh, I go schematically. Uh, and by the way, how much time do I have so I can kind of calibrate? Um, how am I doing with time? Five more minutes? Yes? Good. Um, so uh, Freud introduces two emotional ties um, in order to account for uh, the uh, uh, riddle of. Uh, the group formation and suggestion. And I go a bit quickly since time is uh, short. The first is desire. He argues that people in a crowd or part of a crowd are in a relationship of desire or eros with the leader. He defines desire as wanting to have and he links desire to libido and object cataxis. Uh, the examples uh, of uh, eros uh, are of course in the Oedipal theory, the matter, but uh, uh, he gives the example of an organized masse group, uh, the church or the army. And there Jesus or the leader, argues Freud, have uh, the power to generate a, a, a libidinal, libidinal tie between the crowd and the leader that is vertical. So members of a church, let's say, uh, love Christ. Uh, and because of this vertical uh, bond, emotional bond, an horizontal bond with the other members of the congregation ensues. So a vertical bond with a leader generates an horizontal bond with the crowd. That's the initial Freudian explanation of this departure from uh, the um, uh, previous models. But then he complicates it by saying that uh, he introduces the notion of a second emotional tie, which he calls identification. Uh, and he opposes identification to desire. If desire is wanting to have, identification is wanting to be like, to be, to be like the leader. Um, this is uh, what uh, uh, Plato uh, and uh, Freud call, re relies on Plato when he speaks of eros as a bond, would call mimesis. Uh, uh, and uh, in the case of uh, Freud, uh, is this identification with the meneur which he translates as Führer, uh, that plays an equal role in uh, the formation of the group. So here it gets a little bit technical, but the problem for Freud, if I say it schematically, is that there are two emotional ties uh, that generate a triangle in the case of the family, of the individual psychology that is trained to analyze out of psychoanalysis, uh, because there is a father and a mother, but if there is only one leader, there is a certain structural complication in having two emotional ties going on at the same time. And uh, the example that it gives is an example of a contagious outbreak of hysteria in a, in a dorm in which a girl catches, uh, in which a girl receives a letter from a lover, catches a fit, fit of hysteria that then spreads throughout the dorm. Uh, this is the, the crucial example for Freud's triangulation. And Freud says it would be a mistake to assume that the other girls catch the emotion by sympathy. 
directly by emotional contagion. That would have been the previous crowd psychology. He says, it is because the other girls would li also like to have a lover, would also desire uh, that relationship with a lover, that identif they identify with that particular point and through an identification, then contagion ensues. It's a bit of a uh, detour, but I think it shows that for Freud, uh, Eros remains primary. Uh, in the sense that there is no uh, outbreak without that identification with the love embodied by the writer of the letter that causes the outbreak uh, in uh, the girl first and in the crowd afterwards. So Eros libido precedes mimesis um, and identification. And I, the reason I sketched it is because this is the Freudian solution to the riddle, that is to posit two distinct emotional ties, one of desire and one of identification in which love precedes mimesis uh, is because people in a crowd love their leader that they identify with each other horizontally. Um, but Freud was not at all happy with that solution. Uh, and that is not often mentioned. That's in a footnote. Uh, he says, we, were very, we are very well aware that we have not exhausted the nature of identification with these examples taken from pathology and that we have consequently left part of the riddle of group form, form formation untouched. And he adds, a path leads from identification by way of imitation to empathy, ein Fühlung, that is to the comprehension of the mechanism by means of which we are enabled to take up at any attitude at all towards another mental life. So for Freud, there is another path that starts not with love, eros, but with identification, mimesis, by way of empathy or Einfühlung, it's a term that comes out of aesthetics, that could be pursued. Uh, and uh, this is basically what I try to do uh, by developing the notion of the mimetic unconscious. And so we're coming towards the end of my talk, that is to follow that path that Freud didn't follow from imitation to Einfühlung, and uh, that entail having a concept uh, that doesn't neatly divides desire from mimesis. Mm. And I call that mimetic pathos, using the ancient uh, word pathos that is often translated as emotion or affect or suffering, but it's actually very difficult to translate. And uh, that uh, for the ancients doesn't advocate or doesn't distinguish between desire and my nieces. For Freud, you need two ties because he wants a triangle. That's something that Deleuze says. You need two ties to form a triangle, but I don't think the triangulation is necessary to account for fascist contagion. There is a physio-psychological tradition that posits uh, an innate tendency to imitate uh, that has been rediscovered by neuroscientists via the discovery of mirror neurons, and I won't discuss that here, but that posits that intersubjectivity is primary. Uh, that the subject is from the very beginning intersubjectively linked to others through imitation. And therefore that the subject is porous, relational and plastic uh, and, and therefore open to influences. And that can be good or bad. Uh, that's not necessarily in itself uh, um, a moral judgment on the contrary. Uh, and these influences can be psychic or social. Mm. And so the mimetic unconscious that uh, I develop in the new fascism book and more de in detail in the Phantom of the Ego book is a political unconscious because it posits sociality and politics within the formation of subjectivity itself. It doesn't posit a break between consciousness and the unconscious, but posits the existence of degrees of consciousness that can vary uh, depending on context and uh, um, uh, collective situations. In a crowd, there is a lowering of conscious and awareness, which doesn't mean that we are asleep. Um, and above all, this mimetic unconscious is not based on a repressive hypothesis, but on a mimetic hypothesis. So maybe I just conclude by giving you the example I had promised at the beginning of that presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, where uh, we, I was in a, a discussion um, with a psychoanalyst, Sergio Benvenuto, and he was explaining in the Zoom meeting that I reproduce here, a particular mechanism of internalization that is internal 
to the Freudian account, internalization of the leader through identification, um, and that uh, generates the formation of the superego and the repressive hypothesis is linked to that. Um, and uh, what happened during the meeting and during this presentation is that uh, uh, neo-fascists started to scribble on, 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 the, on the slide and using symbols like the swastika and other uh, obscenities or viva il duce, so a clearly uh, anti-fascist attack that interrupted uh, the, the meeting. Um, and we resumed it on a separate meeting and, uh, and there the question came up of uh, fa Freud's famous analogy of the lecture room. If you remember in the introductory, introductory lectures to psychoanalysis, Freud gives this analogy to explain the unconscious. He's giving a lecture in a lecture room and there is a student who is causing uh, an uproar. And so uh, uh, the lecture room stands for consciousness and the professor Freud himself stands for the ego. And, uh, and uh, um, Freud says, well, you know, we can remove this disturbing figure by asking a couple of students to lock him outside, put him outside of the door. And that exclusion, that repression generates the unconscious. Um, and so the division between the room inside and room outside is used in Freud's analogy to, to illustrate the repressive hypothesis that presupposes a door and a mechanism to uh, um, block uh, uh, certain insurrections. And what I, what I had to remind to my colleagues, psychoanalysts, is that in the digital age, we don't have those doors. The, or the doors are open uh, and, and the attack illustrated that. There was no way of blocking the attack uh, online and the space online doesn't operate, in my view, on a repressive hypothesis of the unconscious, but on a contagious uh, hypothesis in which uh, hypermimesis, and that's another concept that I propose, flows from fictional figures that we are accustomed to, or we might be accustomed to uh, via televised fictions that can become easily realities because the line between fiction and reality in the digital age is increasingly blur blurred. And once a leader is in a position of power, and relies on social media, spirals of hypermimetic contagion that I describe in more detail in the book can emerge um, that generate real insurrections. Uh, and so uh, the case of January 6th uh, is just a manifestation in which hypermimesis no longer operates on any repressive hypothesis, but is amplified contagiously by social medias that rely on algorithms that tap into predispositions that are already there in the subject. Uh, and those predispositions are mimetic or hypermimetic. And I think that here we have a manifestation of what I call uh, the mimetic unconscious that unfortunately cannot be easily repressed, doesn't set up a clear cut distinction between consciousness and the unconscious. The, and uh, at the same time shows that the individual and political uh, uh, unconscious are two sides of the same the same coin and can easily be explored. So I think I'll I'll end here. Uh, the image is indeed one of an alleg uh, you know the allegory of the cave in which we might find ourselves chained uh, still uh, at the bottom of a cave, which doesn't mean that there are no doors to try to exit. Just that th those chains are emotional or affective, generate uh, a type of contagion that already Plato indicated is uh, at play in mimesis. And uh, I think that spaces like this can be used in order to try, if not to completely break the chains, at least uh, to wake up a little bit more from, from that spell, which I think is powerfully at work uh, in insidious ways. So thanks for your attention and I stop here. Uh, so all questions or comments uh, that you have are most welcome. Thank you.